Welcome to the last minute show. This month's uh, show features uh, Anna Teresa de Kersmaker, uh, the Belgian choreographer, and her lecture on her work called Work Travail Arbeit, which was presented at MoMA this month. Um, she came to the Graduate Center CUNY to um, tell us a little bit about the process of transforming Vortex Temporum uh, into a museum uh, location an exhibition format and uh, she explains the process and the motivations uh, and the thinking behind um, that exodus so to speak uh, in amazing detail this recording actually uh, falls short of the lecture in a way that um, her explanations her physical explanations are not possibly uh, delivered through the sound uh, she actually moved and t uh, walked her lecture, so to speak, and it was it was a fascinating experience in and of, in and of itself. Uh, we talk about you know embodying uh, knowledge and performing uh, knowledge, performing lectures, so on and so forth, but her uh, presentation, her visit was. A superb example of that that kind of went beyond um, all these you know discourse around uh, lecture performances and whatnot without necessarily intending to do so but she's a very uh, I mean she's a choreographer she is very attuned to communicating through movement and body so that's not a coincidence um, and it's a fascinating story um, of a choreographer's working process, but also uh, the process of sharing the work after its completion. So it's a, it's a very rare uh, story, I would say. And that's why I wanted to share uh, this with you, although it's... The recording is um, of a very intimate environment, of a very intimate uh, meeting. Um, so I'm also hesitating um, whether this represents, or through this medium of broadcasting, whether it kind of corresponds to what it's originally intended. But nevertheless, um, I think <laughs> our emissions always take that into consideration in one way or another. Uh, this is also for me a chance to uh, silence myself because um, I initially I thought of talking a little bit more about uh, Vortex Temporum and Work Travai Arbeit and c maybe comparing my experiences of both works. I saw a Vortex Temporum in October at BAM in New York and I went to MoMA exhibition um, two days in a row for a couple of hours um, and I had the chance to reflect on both works extensively. Uh, however, uh, Turkish politics are not um, allowing me to have a clear uh, sense and articulation today. Um, so instead, instead of complaining and mourning, uh, I will leave the um, stage, so to speak, to the charisma care, who is definitely way more articulate than I am. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy. And I, uh, I'm also realizing that this month is kind of like a follow-up to the previous month. We are talking about um, performance, performances choreography and uh, they're 
structures, which is also um, a dramaturgical concern. In the question and answer part of uh, the lecture, you will see that the questions from the audience, almost all of them relate to dramaturgical issues. Uh, so we might as well call this a follow-up to the last month's um, dance and dramaturgy uh, theme. And maybe next month, <laughs> if I can um, do my homework and <laughs> find uh, interesting voices and sounds, next month maybe um, follow uh, this theme as well because I think it's a very important field. Um, that's the discourse of it is just developing now. So I hope you enjoy and see you next month. Rainy uh, New York morning. Um, my name is Peter Eckersall and I'm the uh, executive officer of the PhD program in theater uh, at the Graduate Center. And on behalf of myself and Frank Henschke, who's the Executive Director, we're all executives here, we give ourselves very powerful <laughs> um, Executive Director of the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Centre. Um, we're very much honoured to welcome um, Anne Teresa de Kiesmarker here today, who's very generously given us some time out of her very busy schedule. Uh, some of us have already seen the work that's uh, been um, unfolding up at MoMA uh, over the last uh, two or three days, and it's continuing today and tomorrow. And is it also on Sunday, I think, as well? Or, yeah, so if you haven't seen the work yet, I really do recommend that uh, you spend some time with it. It's uh, absolutely, I was there yesterday and I'm planning to go back tomorrow. Um, uh, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, introduction to uh, Mr. Kiersmarker's work, a uh, very significant and distinguished choreographer, who I'm sure you're all familiar with some of the details, but uh, just this morning I was reviewing some of the... Uh, lengthy um, uh, contributions to the field and uh, I, I think that they're some of the most distinguished contributions of, a, of an artist of our generation. Uh, um, so, um, so we welcome the distinguished choreographer Anne Teresa de Kiersmarker to the Graduate Centre and we're most grateful that you've given us some time today. Uh, I'm sure that you already know that Mr Kiersmark is working with, her co uh, working with her company Roses has been making work for more than three decades. Um, uh, she's no stranger to New York. She studied here at NYU. Uh, some of her first work was made in New York, and there's a very strong relationship to particularly, I think, New York choreographic scene and, and music scene. And, uh, you know, as you know, there's this very strong relationship between music and movement in her, in her practice. Um, based in Brussels, Mr. Kiersmarker was one of the artists working at Kai Theatre in the 1980s and is one of the generation of the so-called Flemish wave of uh, that really innovative and important, I mean globally influential scene and um, my own connection there is that um, um, uh, Marianne van Kirkhoven was one of my uh, teachers as a dramaturg so I have a very mm -hmm. strong kind of emotional connection to, the, to that place and to the artists that worked at that time and created such wonderful work. Known for her exploration of everyday and exceptional movement, Mr. Kiersmarker's work has given new insights into movement as sensitive, exhilarating and intermediate form. Uh, she has made much loved and influential works, among them Rosa Stance Rosas, Drumming, Rain and Vortex Temporium, the uh, work that is remade in such a surprising and for me revelatory way uh, at the, in the current project at MoMA. Uh, which is called Work, Travail, Albeit. Our discussion today is going to begin with a short conversation between Mr. Kiersmarker and Frédéric Leroy, who's from the University of Ghent and currently a visiting uh, Siegel scholar at, the, at our theatre program here at the Graduate Centre. And then we'll open it up to a more uh, general discussion and we invite contributions from around the table for what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating discussion on the work that in my viewing yesterday, I found to be moving, exciting and surprising in its informality and its accumulation of gestures and forms. It was an experience of, I was there from the beginning of the morning and then uh, suddenly things would happen and then uh, suddenly it would 
turn into a, a, a very complicated work and, and it was almost like you didn't really see the way that it, that it kind of accumulated it for its forms and brought them into existence. It was a truly, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, revelatory and, uh, and as I said to one of our PhD students who was there with me, it was one of the great days to be in the office in theatre studies and to be able to go to work and see that kind of work. It's, Part of our work, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a, absolutely an honour to be able to work do that kind of thing. So, thank you once again. It's a great pleasure to have you here, and uh, I'll pass it over to Frederic now, who's going to begin a discussion about this work in, in at MoMA. So, thank you, Frederic. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter and Frank, also mm. for making this possible, and thank you also for my part for being here. Um, this is a bit of a two-stage uh, rocket with the introduction of Peter and now I'm going to ask some questions to kind of bring us into orbit uh, and, and think about this work together, work to by uh, Arbeid. Uh, I think you'll all agree with me that it is an extremely um, rich work that starts from a very simple question, so how can we make choreography into an exhibition, um, but is at the same time addressing numerous uh, um, issue is a vast array of issues about choreography, about experiencing choreography, about the different spatial and temporal temp uh, parameters of uh, dance performance and of the exhibition, about the interaction between uh, the performing arts and the visual arts, each with their own um, historically established codes, uh, rituals and modes of spectatorship, uh, about the physical, material and immaterial labor of dance and of performing. Uh, music and doing those um, together. It also invites us, of course, to think about how a choreography in the museum can become a way to look back at uh, somebody's uh, choreographer's or an artist's um, oeuvre. And I want to start off with that, with that kind of res retrospective gaze, because I do understand that at the start of your project or your interest to make this project, you deliberately didn't want to uh, make a retrospective of your own work. So I was uh, wondering if to get this going, you could go back and kind of go to that initial thinking and initial thinking process when you were exploring the idea of creating a work that could be watched from different perspectives. And at the same time, there was this invitation of wheels to show um, something, make a project for the exhibition uh, space. Yes. Well, yeah, as you know, I started to make work in 1980. 82? No? Yes, 1982 when I made... Uh, actually, 1980... 80 was Ash, I think. 1980 was Ash. You're a good scholar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1980 was Ash. But the, the 1982 and 1981 I made files of violin phase while I was studying at uh, on 2nd Avenue on the School of the Arts at... Tish. You know, I was studying here for one year in the evenings. I was working uh, uh, on that solo. I had that music with me when I left from Brussels. Uh, for me, it was uh, it was a discovery. Uh, discovery the city. Discovery a lot of different uh, ways of performing, uh, both in the so-called avant-garde scene, and but also on Broadway and so. And then, act actually, over those uh, 35 years, I mean, indeed, as you said, I've been making nearly 50 performances, which are in the classical black box theater. Yeah. Um, I rarely, the only thing what we would change was in, when you're in summer festivals, you would go in the open air, but mm. still with a normal traditional setting. Yeah, you have a... You have walls, you have the box, the wall on top, on the sides, and people watch to you uh, in the front. Um, the very first time, actually it was in MoMA, when I performed... Uh, violin phase, I think? Violin phase. And violin phase, when it was asked to perform it in the atrium, we did it in the sand. And now I'm thinking aloud, actually, that idea of performing it in the sand and that the geometrical pattern that underlies it is emerging from was actually coming from the film experience when Thierry de Mey, uh, uh filmed Fase we decided not to put it in the in the black box but we went for each dance in a different location and one of the locations was that violin phase was done in the forest and uh, 
uh, it was Thierry who suggested, wouldn't be that the writing of the dance would emerge through the action. So uh, he came with the proposition of using the sand and that every move would leave a trace, yeah, sort of like yeah, my footsteps draw the geometry. And for that it was necessary uh, to, it was also good to allow like a top view, we used a camera that was a fixed image. Yeah. And I think there's a picture in here. Yeah, there was a picture of that in here. And that that idea was actually taken back, yeah. Yeah. That idea was actually taken back when we came to to MoMA and it was really inspired by um by one the idea okay violin face is in a circle so a circle form allows itself to be seen you know from all different sides it's when you go to washington square or you go whatever is an open space and somebody starts to do something it's like somebody starts to make a fire and people go around and sit around and observe. And everybody is in a kind of democratic relationship to what is happening. Yeah. Um, the crowd, the, 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 the circle with large, uh, the more people there are. Yeah, or that will get thicker. But anyway, that is the, um, that is the normal situation. And just coming up from an, I don't know if you, I think there are very beautiful pictures of Cunningham on the Plaza de San Marco in um, Venice. I think in the 50s or 60s, performing on the Plaza de San Marco and the geometry of those circles changing according to how the dance uh, changed. Well, anyway, that was one thing. It was the <coughs> circularity and then there was the top view. Hmm. So uh, it was uh, a new experience for me when I, uh, I came to MoMA and did that. I really, uh, uh, I really enjoyed the, I really enjoyed the daylight. Hmm. Yeah, uh, the whiteness of the space combined with the daylight. I, I enjoyed the the. the being surrounded by the people, yeah. Uh, I enjoyed the m mixity, do you say that, of, of the audience? The mix, yeah. The yeah, you really felt this was mm. visual art per, uh, audience, this was dance audience, this was tourists, this was people who just came by. <laughs> and you felt like sort of in between a museum and a marketplace. Um, mm. That that was really nice. It was also it brought the thought. Uh, of course, it's not only visually changing, but suddenly hearing this music filling the space, this enormous space of the of the museum, the music, uh, the repetitive music of Steve Reich. Um, yeah, it's a mm. it's a. I think even more as the visual aspect, the. The hearing. Yeah. The hearing is really consistently changing. Mm. The, n what we use as being the environment in a museum. Museums are a little bit like churches, or like mm -hmm. uh, there is this notion of silence. Yeah. Yeah. And. And I think that is important if you come into MoMA, even here, if you enter there and you've been there before, you already hear the music. The space yes. is already has already a, a totally different energy. Yeah. But I understand also that this, this, this idea of working in a circle is also something that is part of being in a rehearsal in a studio, that it's also Absolutely. the perspective of the choreographer uh, on, a, on a piece, that you have the privilege as a choreographer to have what spectators normally don't because they're in the front hall proscenium. Absolutely. So, so what happened is then, then afterwards followed the invitation of opening the tanks at uh, Tate Modern, mm -hmm. and there I did not only violin phase, but we decided we did two versions of uh, the whole phase, which mm -hmm. is four parts: piano phase, come out, uh, clapping music, and, and yeah, violin, yeah, phase. violin phase. Yes, and we did it at 
We did it in the, the circular tanks. People were all around. This is not a big empty space, but it is a really it's a tank. It's an industrial space. A bunker. It's a bunker. <laughs> people could be around. Mm. People could be around, but there still was a chalk line that invited people not to invade in that space. And it, it was at three o'clock, at four o'clock. Mm. You know, it was like a, le- a regular meeting point. People could come in, but then for the length of the dance, there would be mm-hmm. no traffic. So when Elena Filipovic and Dirk Snowart came to me and uh, proposed to rethink a performance as an uh, an exhibition as a performance, or a performance as an exhibition, uh, uh, we were. It was quite soon clear for me. I don't want to do a retrospective. We had done in the Palais des Beaux Arts before, at in two thousand one, what, two. We did for the twenty years of Rosas. We did a sort of with documents retrospective. What was like a sort of. Um, not in a literal way, but rather in a more poetic, visually poetic way, like giving insight and making parallel images that related to to the mm. to the work with drawings, with pictures, with film images. Your, you, you had your notebooks, for example. You saw exactly. the drawings that you used yes. during the or but the opening of it process. was the film of violin face right. in the sand. Yeah. which was projected. So uh, immediately she immediately invited, uh, Elena immediately said, let's try to think about, think it, as, think it in a different way. And at that very time I was rehearsing Vortex Temporum, title of the, of the music, yeah. um, a Spiral of Times. The very notion is... Uh, Condensing time, uh, and, extend, and, and stretching ext- it, and or? extending it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, the, in a, in a quite analytical way, I ask myself the way. Okay, so what is specific if I'm in a museum? You know, what is specific in about in a museum, in the, in the most direct, and what is specific whether when I'm in the black box. And so we, we listed sort of up, I listed the things right. up in yeah. the sense from uh, time, the time perception duration is different. Uh, the museum is open between 11 and 6, which actually are the working hours of... Uh, A dancer rehearsing or... Well, no. yeah, the <laughs> Rosa's company. Well, we start at 9.30. But, um, <laughs> um, that's one thing. We work during the day. I, we Once we're in performance, we're in night birds. We're always in the dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, We're always somehow dancing in the dark, not only during in the black box, but also, you know, your whole social life is... Uh, your whole social life is organized around... Your, your, your activity and your social life is around around the evening mm-hmm. yeah where the labor is done during the day yeah mm-hmm. so it is always when you go into performances is you you go into somehow it always has to go into the secret of the of the night yeah, yeah. Um, then it was you have a beginning of an ending this is the idea uh, if you miss the performance you come too late you're not there here was the thing it has to there has to be a notion of duration there has to be continuity. This, let's say, like incredible luxury. Uh, of course, in, in the, the object is made and it stays there, and I come back and it is still there, like suspended in time. Mm. Yeah, and here we want to have an activity going on. So I was wondering, and then he was wondering, what is when do people dance for hours? And you think of rituals, no? Mm. They do rain dances to, to. Then you think of what do you think of? Rehearsals. Uh, rehearsals, yeah, rehearsals. Then you think of 
competitions. No, mm -hmm. they shoot horses down, don't yeah. they? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of. But there is this notion of there is anyway this notion that in the way I work is it's quite this notion of duration and horizontality and literally going step by step to step, step by step. Mm -hmm. Like a little bit like working in the fields, you know. We go to the fields and we. Yeah. And uh, that that is really proper to to uh, dancing to dancing, and it's always compared to other. It's a collective experience. Mm -hmm. Well, as a choreographer, you maybe will need time to work alone, but the building, the act of writing, the work itself is always of extremely mm -hmm. social intense period. Now, specifically also with Vortex Temporum, because of this music and this, as it says, the spiral of times, I, uh, I always use, you know, I've developed over those 30 years, my main relationship has been, from the beginning has been music. At a certain point, my, through my collaboration with Anne Veronica Janssens, I really found, also Michel Francois, but mainly Anne Veronica, I found a partner with whom I could share and who inspired me uh, and who guided my gaze uh, in looking at things differently than into geometrical patterns, but in mm. the very much reality of, okay, what are the, the components from what I see on stage in terms of light, in terms of um, how the light sculptures the space. Um, so, so where am I? Yeah, um, I, I um, till their music always gives the time frame, mm. and uh, um, I was yeah I was looking at how we could transpose it and bring that to the the museum, mm. inspired by the very nature and and action of what the rehearsals were. Yeah, so yeah, you that, say that the work is the rehearsal and the rehearsal yeah. is the work. Yeah. This is, it's, I, I find it interesting because about your own work, you choreographies that are on the stage, actually, you once said the performance is the, the performance of the work and the work is the performance. Yes. Really thinking about this relation between the vocabulary that's being developed during the rehearsals is what you are going to see. In the museum, the interesting thing is that in the museum, normally you see the work has been done. You see a work that is already finished. Yes. While in performance, you always, in one way or another, are uh, a witness to both uh, the creation uh, of the work and you receive the work. And, and those yes. happen at, a, at the same time to a certain extent because there's of course, yes. especially in your case, a, a pre-existing uh, choreography. Um, maybe Peter, you could show the next, uh, the next image. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite struck that you say that you make this association with the, with the Demay film of uh, the choreography or the writing kind of emerging out of your, out of your dancing. Um, Vortex Temporum, the piece, the dance piece was extremely dense, condensed, a very complex polyphonic work of sound and movement. Uh, 50 minutes, I think, about, or an hour or 40 minutes, something like that. Um, now, of course, you're working in nine hours and you've totally um, deconstructed or decomposed this um, this piece. Um, I was wondering if you could think about that as well, about how the museum allowed you to show some of the choreographic principles that you work with, to somehow makes the, make these transparent in the same way that the score emerges out of your dancing in, in the, the violin phase. Well, you know, Vortex to Form is difficult music. It's complex music. It's extremely layered. Yeah? Uh, it is not easy listening mu music and it's not easy dancing music mm. because the pulse is, it's, it's not really harm, har harm, it's quite dissonant. There is no regular pulse like in, for example, the whole minimal music scene and the, the pulse is, is floating. But anyway, the music gives the, uh, um, the, the, the framework. I decided to, uh, pour faire to make the, the, the beauty of that music accessible and that people could have uh, um, um, 
natural understanding or readability mm. of that complexity to link one musician to one dancer. Yeah. And there are three strings, two winds, one piano, and a conductor. So every dancer is linked to one uh, um, instrument. Yeah. In instrument. Uh, we, I build it layer by layer. Yeah, layer by layer. So that will means com consistently we have the score and we say, okay, to, we look today from bar 10 to bar 15, what is the clarinet doing? Right. Yeah? The clarinet doing, and then there are, are a number of unifying principles. The unifying principles is one is uh, a geometrical pattern that you see based on a pentagram. There is a circle. There is a circle, and there are. There is a circle. You know, this is the basic circle. Mm -hmm. That's what we call the Carlos circle. It's, Carlos is the piano. And actually, the, the, the definition of the work is a vortex and form, uh, a six. It's a, it's a sextet for piano and and winds and strings. Hmm. So the piano is time-wise, melody-wise, texture-wise, is combining the two families, the wind families and the string families. So I thought <coughs> that Carlos, um, one person who is the piano, there are two persons for the piano because I decided for the left hand and the right hand, is linked this, uh, on, on this circle. And that circle is a pentagram. Like this. Yeah, I think the next image is even clearer. Uh, if you then the next like, image is yeah, I, this one. Yes. Uh, is this helpful? Really no. Okay. Just yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 that's, I, that's still another story. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I decided. Okay. To all the instruments, this is the cello. This is the uh, alto, the violin, clarinet. Flute. Piano is this. Um, first movement. First movement, uh, we start. That is one thing. This is the pattern yeah, that unifies it. Then, the basic movements are, on one hand, the very simple act of walking. Yeah, because why? Walking organizes both your time, but it also organizes your space. I mean, I can come close to you, I can go far away from you, but it also I can do it at different speeds. I use a system which is sort of not done, the so-called mm. Mickey Mouse. In, I call it intelligent Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> intelligent world. Mickey Mouse. You know, you have two relationships between uh, I have developed over those 20, 30 years a lot of different strategies between music and dance that I, that's what I'm mainly interested in. I steal my ideas from music a lot. Um, and from how composers organize time and space. There is the cage kanyan relationship, which is where dance and music are totally independent from each other. The other is what I call Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse goes up the stairs, da 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 dee. Mickey Mouse goes down the stairs. <laughs> Um, you will still have what you have in classical ballet, where you have a narrative that is uh, narrative which is conducting. The, um, but I think that there is between those two extremes are a whole lot of different possibilities. There is a whole range of existing strategies and in, and in strategies to invent. Yeah. So uh, in the three movements of vortex temporum, the first one we start on this circle here, and the music is played alone. What is this circle? The circle is the most traditional concert version. Yeah? When you go to a concert, musicians go to sit in a circle, and, or it's a whole orchestra sitting like that, but it's basically the half of the circle. The other half is a circle, are the, is mm -hmm. the audience. Yeah? Uh, why is it the best? It's the best so that the, uh, musicians can communicate mm. between each other. They share the center. 
Normally they do it with a conductor. I asked them to do it by heart. That was a big challenging thing because it's really complicated music. But uh, I once, uh, I, when I, before I took the final decision of using that music, I went to a rehearsal and this was about the space from here and what, what is so beautiful in chamber music in this small constellation, it is how people connect with each other, you know, how they have to listen, they have their score, and their score, but they're busily, like in some part, at writing, you know, it is really about how you create, how you fuse sound together, how you organize your time, how you create the materiality of sound together, and it's extremely theatrical. Yeah, it's extremely precise and theatrical uh, in, 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 in the same way. So I thought, let's start with, I go step by step. That's what fascinates me, let me show first. That what is the, the DNA of the performance, namely the musicians are sitting there. That in the first movement, the dancers take the place of the, of the, of the musicians and then we, as I said, one musician is linked to one uh, dancer. And I created, uh, it was a movement of the walking, but it was also a movement which I call a kind of tenor line. It is the line that holds the architecture of the movement. And that is based on a series of 20 movements, which actually are uh, extremely simple. They basically go, they think of human posture being the verticality of the spine, like this, and horizontal being that. You know, the, the, the verticality of my spine is, is the very definition of, of, uh, of, of human posture, because what makes a difference with animals, animals they have their spine mm -hmm. horizontal, what's happening basically when you start from a uh, the third is, is that you, you go out like this, yeah, and then you have three centers, this is a center, this is a center, this is a center, and when you go, you go, from a kid you grow out, up, and then when you die you sort of scramble again, yeah. Um, your walking is already Basically what you do is play with gravity, walking is weight shifts from one left to right. But I decided to create a movement which is basically formed here, where it takes the center here, and that is in 20 movements where I in where it's not only a geometrical pattern on the floor, but it's three-dimensional. And it is initiated from here, like this movement one. Movement two, I have the weight shift. Movement three, I start to spiral. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Movement, a series of 20 movements which sort of um, spiral like this. And then from that basic DNA, um, the dancers build that longer phrases. For example, this movement can be transformed in that, mm. or it can be, uh, you know, I take the shape and I turn it around, yeah. So, uh, where was I getting to? Um, in the first movement, we are on place in space, we don't move in the space, <coughs> but the movement is linked, every instrument, every dance to is an instrument, and it's only, like, basically spiral movement. In the second movement, the second movement, the whole constellation on this joint circle starts to turn. Yeah. You know, here the turning is around my own spine. Here it is, we're going to walk, and it is like a big clockwork or a mm -hmm. big spiral that, you know, everybody has this, this, this circle, and then we're going to move counterclockwise. Yeah counterclockwise besides the piano because that is if you want to if you want to have a lot of if you want to have silence you have to shortly shortly make a lot of noise 
-hmm. Yeah, if you want, like in cooking, if you want to some having to something sweet, like for example, uh, in fruit, you better put a little bit of salt, salt on it. Yeah. yeah, you don't put sugar on sugar, but you put on something that is sweet, you put a little bit of salt. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, I, the main movement is continuously counterclockwise, uh, counterclockwise and kind of goes clockwise. Mm. Yeah, so you, you get this opposite. Uh, in the third movement, here this quite condensed in space, in the second movement the rotation element is the most, and then it opens up. We go from those smaller circles, like these circles, we go into the big circles, you see, mm. and then we hit the we hit the the limits or the balls of yeah. the space, and then in the third movement we gonna go there. We gonna combine what was exposed in the first movement, in these movements, but making them travel in space. Mm. Yeah, and the music is built up. What he says talks about those three the dimension of times. The expanded time, the time of the whales, sort of cosmic time, uh, a suspended time, slowness. The third, the, the, the condensed time, which he calls the syncopated time, and time of the insects, mm -hmm. before you can perceive something like. Uh, and then the, the, the middle time, he considers like time of speech, of. Uh, the time of the humans. Yeah. Um, he constantly sort of, basically in the second movement, this this like nearly ritual way how it starts to turn, and there is a regular beat that organizes it. Uh, but then afterwards, both the space and the time they they condense mm. and they open up. At certain points, the mass sort of condenses in the middle. You get like the mass disappears on the five points of the pentagon, and then they open up. Mm. But this is all, how shall I say, embodied. Yeah. And what is, of course, completely different. No, what what happened? Now I get to my point. <laughs> <laughs> is that when Elena Filipovich came to ask me, I was fully busy with constructing this in the day life from 11 to 6. And I was doing this work where I would build this third <laughs> movement. And I was saying, OK, uh, this morning we're going to work only on the clarinet. And, uh, and I was sort of uh, seeing this and how I put all those layers separate, one after the other. And I, I said, oh, I find this so beautiful. And I find it beautiful not only to, uh, it would be dancing to watch it from here, but I would go on the other side and say, oh, it's a totally different perspective. It's super nice also. And I was saying, but I'm never going to be able to do this in the black box because otherwise we're going to have to make a performance of uh, nine hours, ten hours. Uh, and I used all the different combinations and I was sort of sad and uh, uh, frustrated that it was not going to be possible to do that, hmm. neither to look at it from different angles, neither to make live performance. Well, of course you can do that, uh, you could make performances that, uh, but uh, that hmm. it, it was not... Uh, so, so when Elena came to do it, and, and I thought, well, it... it uh, this unlayering, this deconstructing, mm -hmm. decomposing would be perfect. Uh, uh, to do in the in the exhibition space. Do it in the exhibition space. Of course, in the exhibition space, there is you have this um, choreography as scripted movement, which has been developed and is set. But there is also something incredibly unchoreographic about this space, in the sense that there is, of course, the presence of spectators. So. Who, who move through the space, who influence the dance. Um, what are the protocols that exist next to uh, the choreography? Well, it's very, it's, it's quite simple. Eh? This, the, 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 the vortex temporum spiral of times, the basic material is water. Mm. It's mm. liquid. 
you know, this is a line, a, a line drawn, and this is an organizing principle. But what is the property of, of water is that right. if, if it comes, it goes around. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it, it goes around. You know, you, you're not hitting like, yeah. like, like that. So if you're a dancer, you better be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You better be, it's, it's the nature of, of the, the, the thing. So when something, what is the big force of water is that when something comes, you, you, you adapt. You know, you adapt, you go around, and you... Uh, um, so the time frame is given by the music. The, the, the spatial framework is given by this geometry. But it is... A, 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 the energy of the movement is water. So what our thing is, it, it pushes wherever it finds its space. It changes, of course, the movement is changed by the amount of mass in the room. Yeah. So in wheels, it was way much more shorter, uh, way much more uh, uh, smaller, smaller. There were pillars and there were two spaces. But so, for example, at the opening night, there were like in this relatively small space, there were like um, 300, 400 people. And you, you can see it in the, in the picture of, of things. So the movement would... Uh, would interfere. There is a picture of wheels, if you, if you, but it's yeah. if, yes. But this is a. Th these are empty the space. these are the yeah. movements of. Uh, these are the movements, the basic movements of. Uh, the basic phrase, yeah. Yeah, the basic phrase, but there are like I think that there are. There isn't there a thing with only pictures? This is the book with the pictures, yeah. Yeah. But they're in the center, but they still form a perimeter. Like people tend to always want to form a perimeter. Yeah, what, what, it's a normal thing, you know. It, Yesterday I was the dancers are the dancers are a little bit like the dancers are a little bit. Their movement is like water, but their activity is like fire. Mm -hmm. So people organize themselves. It's like moving fire. They're in the center, and yeah. And then the thing is, of course, it's about the density of the architecture. If in wheels there was a pillar. So people hmm. find they find themselves safe, you know. They they can they go step to next week to do what like what happened in Moma the other day. It's really a decision that you say, okay, I'm yeah. going to so go and sit in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to bear the experience. You would be surprised sometimes, like in wheels, people would. Um, yeah, they would have picnics. <laughs> Or it wasn't being they, not the best they, idea. they would make a statement they would be sitting in the middle and then the piano would arrive yeah. Yeah. and they would say, well, I'm going to stay here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to... And they look for the physical... Somebody really tried to do that yesterday. They, they were very resistant to moving and they just put yeah, themselves you know, there. Like, see, yeah, it was like here. Yeah. It was, yeah. But it, you get the feeling yeah. of the marketplace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But with the only different yeah. thing if you have like hip hop dancing or people sitting in the yeah. middle. But here the thing, the, the movement is, as I say, like fire and water, it, it spills yeah. through. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in the middle yesterday, but then in a moment of two people, you had everyone, to run. we were asked very yeah. graciously yeah. from David's. Yeah. By, by whom? By Mary. I to do that. She didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the moment when they were like racing. It was a really the yeah, moment. Yeah. So. But I, I felt I was traversed by a work, and I've almost never felt traversed by an artwork. Yeah. Uh, and it was really uh, extraordinary. There was also a, a, the, the, a, the more problematic uh, thing is people when people leave their bags or work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or the, yeah. the children, the. the <laughs> who says that? <laughs> Inanimate objects. Start picnicking. This yeah. also happens. <laughs> At the concluding moment of the of the intensity of the spiral, uh, one of the dancers ran to the wall and right next to me, and there's another spectator, and um, and I was struck by the intensity of the movement. This was absolutely a fully committed movement that was really coming to us with a very strong energy, and then. Uh, she was coming very close to the other uh, spectator who was getting quite anxious and there was a beautiful moment where the, the dancer 
kept the energy but smiled at the spectator and said, it's going to be okay. And then she <laughs> somehow managed to just find that space between our two bodies. And mm. But it was actually a full run into the wall. It was very, very precise. Yeah, and, yeah. Architecturally, yeah. I mean, especially yeah. it's built like this. Um, yeah. On certain yeah. moments, they, they gather on those points of the, uh, of the pentagon and then at the... At the Certain moment they, they really hit the limits of the space, mm. and of course because the spectators are on the walls, <laughs> they they become just you all become wall, mm. yeah. all become wall or in the same position. It's interesting, of course, that. But it, it's of course a, a difference when somebody comes to stand next mm. to you uh, like this, or somebody has been like yeah. is like exhausting yeah. and is standing next to you, and and you will really experience. Mm what it means, the labor, the expenditure, expenditure? Mm -hmm. expenditure of energy mm -hmm. and what it mm -hmm. nearly chemically, alchemically, mm -hmm. chemically, alchemically transforms the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the space is really inverted. I mean, in the museum, normally the artworks are against the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here it is actually the spectators who are and the, the art, yeah, the art itself is moving in the, in the middle yeah. somehow. I do remember that it, that is, Switch that's for the cold, yeah. yeah. That is in in the Tate version, which was extremely expansive. That there, having to take the decision was almost like deciding to go and take a walk into a wild wood, or mm -hmm. to, to to jump into a pool or something. You really had to breathe and then yeah. walk in. Yeah. Um, how was it here in MoMA? Because here in MoMA, you, of course, it, there's a transition, uh, there's a passageway, and 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 so the negotiation with people is very different because you you have people who are there and who often are surprised by a dancer passing. They start to move sometimes in a similar way than the dancers, mm -hmm. this kind of like, um, j j like this, mm -hmm. I don't know, j jagged movement or something? Um. Yeah, yeah, well, there's a specific thing that in the, in the atrium you have this, this other space and mm -hmm. then it becomes a transition space. People go over there mm -hmm. and so. And I think that, that it created a lot of um, additional traffic uh, but it, it was the challenge was to find an elegant way not to oppose to that, not to deny it and not to oppose it. Yeah, not to say as if it wasn't there, but uh, so to to create situations where that would invite the people, not to forbid them to go there, but in a way, in an elegant way, to invite them to hang around and to stay yeah. and to be. On their way, be maybe suspended and and, and wait. Mm. Can, can I ask if um, there are two very different artworks in the in the in the room that people have to walk through the space to get to? One by Fugashi Teji and one by Nan Goldman. Do you do you have any awareness of, of the what the other artworks are in the space? I must say, uh, yeah. I do agree. In all honesty, I I I, I haven't had oh, yeah, yeah. time to. Yeah. I was just wondering. No, people... I've been so much up yeah. but, but mm. you're actually mm. right. I should have. They come with that memory into your space, and vice versa. Or they just yeah. some people are single-mindedly saying, "I'm going to see that artwork." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they have to negotiate, uh, and they're not expecting to see the yeah. work, and so yeah. it's a surprise for them. I think, which was yeah. very interesting. Yeah. We've. Um, I what I what I find the most what I've seen. The, the, what I find the most interesting mm -hmm. things is these kinds of phenomena, phenomena because it was especially in in um, wheels in wheels yeah people had to come through the door you know so so you really would have um, people coming in <laughs> and uh, you're a dancer and they would come and uh, and they would go like <laughs> Yeah, but right yeah. away, you know, yeah. spending uh, yeah. three minutes in it and coming yeah. and like putting this thing <laughs> like closed and was like, yeah. it's was uh, a, it's it yeah. was really yeah. like. Uh, there was a work last year by Maria Hasabi in MoMA, and it was very slow and very still, and basically it became a lot of selfie opportunities. Yeah. Where people would actually come up and just take one selfie after another. It was it was it's surprising yeah, how how willing people were to. 
invade the space of the dancer and just go, <laughs> I'm here, I want a selfie now, kind of thing. But it so. was the most photographed, I think, yeah. uh, performance mm. ever, at the, at, at the point that the security guards had to intervene and, and stop some moment, because it was also very intrusive. Yeah. 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 Dancers, yeah. what I noticed in the last few days, that mm. actually i never seen uh, I've never seen a situation when there are no iPhones in the mm. atrium like for the there is some people are just looking mm. they're taking photos but it's so less than usual that I'm yeah. still on the shock Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and and of course, yeah, the amount of time that people stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very easy. Well, in, in fact, I think all, all of your work somehow invites um, uh, contemplation. You, you, it somehow invites. It's very easy to sit with the work. I think, and and this is this is absolutely in a similar kind of vein that you arrive and you. It's very easy just to sit with it, and it, it just gradually accumulates in its gestures and its uh, music and its in, in all its dimensions. And I, mm. I find that very fascinating. But it's also I'm also <coughs> aware that there's a you know there's a very precise choreographic mind at work here that is creating this environment for us. And why wouldn't we be precise as choreographers? Oh, well, I'm, <laughs> of course. But in this, <laughs> I guess, I guess the question is, it's the challenge, it's the, the dancing. Yeah. Okay, point taken. But it's, it's the challenge of the, of the open space, because it's very different, I guess. Yes, to, it's true. It's true. Um, so the precision is, is somehow challenged by the architecture of the building, which is very powerful, yeah. and the layers, and it's got those viewing, viewing platforms, and mm. so on and yeah, so forth. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a question well, there. And I would love to ask. Yes, yeah. um, I saw the piece in Berlin a few years ago in a proscenium. Yes, in and Berlin, Berlin, Berlin. yeah. And could you address a little bit more the way you approach the durational problem of the museum, the eleven to six hours vis-à-vis -vis the proscenium time? Well, the the. Um, the normal time of the performance is about one hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I explained before, I unlayered, you know, in the, 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 during the performance, you see there are like one, two, three, four, five, there are six solos. Mm -hmm. Then there are, um, yeah, every string apart, then you have three strings, you have two strings, you have uh, clarinet, violin. Uh, you have, I, I never mix the families. We don't mix mm. the families. Mm. We keep the families separate, the winds and the strings, because it gives strange, yeah, it, it blurs the, uh, the, um, the visual and the auditive, mm -hmm. auditive yeah. readability. So actually what you do is you show it layer by layer. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. You like take the strands apart. Yes. Aha. Mm. Uh -huh. mm. mm. yeah. Thanks. So every nine hours you see a version which is close to the black box version. Aha. Mm. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. In its construction. Yeah. yeah. And then, and it's, it's in that way cyclical and it's, it's built up always in five sequences. The first sequence is drawing of the patterns mm -hmm. we redraw the patterns then it's the music alone of the first there are three movements eh? first movement is done alone then it uh, done by the musicians first movement is done by um, the dancers mm -hmm. in the second movement uh, dancers and music come together and the whole pattern starts to rotate and then the fifth movement is the third movement of the music where the, the musicians are fixed, the dancers invade the space, and then there is a kind of postlude, postlude, prelude, postlude, epilogue, epilogue, epilogue yeah. where the whole thing, cool. like Anger in the Muse, where the whole thing sort of yeah. mm. fades Fate out, out, the movement fades out, and the, and the water sort of spreads to the yeah. extremities of the space. Mm. And there is a clock. There is a clock that they um, that they know 
that they follow and that they know that there is a handover after one hour to a next constellation. Mm -hmm. Aha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the in the second movement, when mm -hmm. the musicians play it first, they play it by heart. In the first movement, the dancers have the music in their heads. Mm -hmm. They have the the music in their heads. So they 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 it's actually their bodies organize the time. You know, they know that they share the visual information, but they 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 know that we've built it with the music, and then I took the music away. Yeah, they they, they can dance it perfectly together with the music, hmm. but um, hmm. they have a inside clock. Well, they yeah they have the music in their minds. You see, you had a question. Uh, yeah, well, not really more of an observation, and it was about your comment about how you felt like the space was somehow held, or there was, there was, and, you know, it was so interesting sitting there yesterday. Um, I, I it, it was taking me back to when I was 12 years old, and I used to come early to the company rehearsals of the ballet company that I was an apprentice with and sit under the grand piano and mm. just watch everything that was happening. And, you know, as what I was feeling yesterday was how held I was by all the structures. And, you know, it wasn't that I was always so consciously aware of it, but then I started looking at it because I was having this memory of the ballet situation. And the, that absolute clarity of each dancer's intention you know, and and then knowing where every spiral was happening, on what plane, yeah. um, on all the micro and macro levels. And then what you're saying now about the ways that you were unlayering a piece, because I felt very strongly the um, thread through of an hour of I am, each yeah. event. You know, I mean, not that every event was an hour, but I felt very strongly the dramaturgy of the time in that way, and so it's, it's really fascinating to hear you talk about these things that I was definitely aware of. You know. mm -hmm. I'm just wondering now, I'm thinking, one of the things that would be nice is, I think in Wheels we had a lot, in Tate also, was kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There haven't been that much kids and very small kids. Mm -hmm. Or they were, they were somehow stopped by the parents. Yes, I've oh, seen that. Mm -hmm. Oh, but yeah, then I, yeah. I, I'm going to go in and say that they should leave them. There were school kids yesterday, too. Yes, there yeah. were hundreds yeah. of them. They would come along the upper level sometimes and stop and watch and yeah. take mm -hmm. pictures. Yeah, but there were the, some little girls there were some in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 were there little girls in, in the middle? Yeah, they were mesmerized yeah. and they yeah. had tutus and this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There was a guard on one of the floors. Mm -hmm. I was there a couple of days ago, and um, just fixated watching. The guards were like really, oh, yeah. really yeah. into yeah. it. There were a couple of guards. Yeah. Um, one was looking for the window. Wow. Yeah, that's one of the things I really like about this. It's not only about watching the dance, but also about watching that's the people cool. watching yeah, the yeah, dance. Yeah, yeah. I have. No, no, go just then. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. I also like have one question about frontalities of the dancers because mm. uh, I enjoy like a run dancers running backwards and then you explain us like clockwise or counterclockwise but at the same time I'm curious why they are running backwards uh, most of the, many of the times <laughs> and I, I enjoy it very much but I also want to know also why and then uh, somehow this the next part is related to this frontality of the space and then at the moment, the space is so high, and then we could go up and then see and, and look down on the mm. stage and space. Uh, but the third floor is closed. I couldn't go up to the third floor. But still, like, I have the perspective coming mm. from the back bulk. And then uh, how would you think about this kind of uh, high door? Verticality. Yeah. 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 About the verticality, about the going backwards. Uh, yes, both um, It's a very, it's a very technical, but it's a very technical thing about how through the movements you sculpture the space. I can, through my body, sculpture a space by the movements I do. 
you know, for example, if I do this, I give a direction to that space, no? Mm -hmm. eh? Or it's a different thing mm -hmm. if I do this, yeah? Or I do this, you know? The way how the architecture of my body sculptures the space. I can do that by my limbs, yeah? But there, there. But the most strongest gaze, uh, the strongest tool to sculpture the space is gaze. Look at this. If I do, yeah, if I do there, yeah, somehow I give it the <laughs> intention of sculpturing that part of the space, yeah. But if I do, for example, there, yeah, or I do there, I made this is stronger than that. The way where I, where I look my gaze is that is the gaze is sculpture in the space, yeah. And what we do when we make this rotational uh, movement, but I need two persons for that. Okay, somebody come. Is that okay? You walk. What, what you what we call facing facing is that uh, I'm gonna turn and you're gonna have parallel with your shoulders with me. I follow you. Yeah, you follow me, but you don't. You <laughs> have to. You 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 your facing are we always the same? You see? Yeah. And now why don't you turn and walk? I'm gonna I'm gonna follow your facing. Okay. Yeah. You can walk where you want in the space. Yeah? Walk wherever you want. Bags. Yeah? So, what it is, I'm following his shoulders and I have from his. You see? And when we walk at high, in through the movement at high speed, I always take what is in my visual field the most in front. And that organizes those rotations with walking. And then we can say, I change, and I'm in, your, in the front of your visual field, so he's following my, you see? And that creates situations where very often, you know, it's actually a system which is inspired by what we call flocking. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when birds are uh, flying in a group, they organize this movement, and you have your peripheral vision, and there are a number of rules. You always follow the one who's in front. You connect to what is close to you and what is far away, but the, the direction is given the one who is the most in front. Uh, you don't want to, yeah, there are a number of rules, like you don't want to be on the outside. You can't fix the formations. The formations have to be liquid in relationship to each other. Number of rules like this, but were, were rules which were Inspired are inspired from the choreography is inspired of that of spatial organization between in natural phenomenon and especially with animals mm. you know and there is also rules about how you organize your speed all those kind of things and that means that it's like improvised according to quite articulated set rules Take a question here, yeah. and then come um, on. Well, I think it would work. Also, um, it's interesting that you talked about water, you know, because that that was sort of the experience in terms of my reception of that. I was very much felt like I was <clears throat> connected at times, or being played, and part of the connection between music and the dynamic between the musician and the dancer. And at other times, I just felt like I was going with with the movement so it was a different experience of art in terms of that I was part of it suddenly but my question is about the dancers and their their experience moving from different spaces and the musicians and have there been any unexpected surprises or challenges as as they move with this work different spaces and different audiences? Well it's physically very intense so there is always a concern of not overloading oh, and and, and injuries you have to, you know, because it's it's 
super intense. And uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes you're, uh, sometimes these kind of things where people coming closely mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. and and being mm -hmm. uh, intrusive, being intrusive and considering like. Um, a physical body also needs care and it needs like it needs showers and fr fresh yeah. clothing and there's it needs to be paid or yeah. Yeah. So, uh, a painting you just buy and it's, kind of it's there yeah. and so uh, could, could you talk about that reality because i think that might well, be something that changing, you're changing you're changing space yeah and different in, yeah. you know different size different um, light different uh, airflow well, there's different aspects. Well, yeah, yeah. For example, in wheels was very. You see, this was normally those windows were covered with wide walls. We we took everything away, or on Veronica took everything away. Uh, here, the sun was starting at that side, and during the day, in wheels, the, the experience with light was very, uh, very, very beautiful. In the texture of 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 the air of the light and so, but also in your experience of time, because of course day and night, mm -hmm. your perception of time is very much. These are the most natural uh, perceptions of time. Is is the sun? No, mm -hmm. sun goes up, sun goes down. Uh, it comes in from there, comes in from there. You know that in the winter it's lower as in the. In, so that was. Very beautiful, and it's of course different in both in Pompidou and here because we, we, uh, I think mainly of security reasons we could not do it. Only put all the all the light out, mm. yeah, and mm. do it all with natural light. Mm. And then there was the the size of the spaces, the fact that here there were two spaces in in Pompidou. There were it was on the same on the ground level, and then everything was. Um, this is statement. This is Pompidou. This is Pompidou. Mm -hmm. So you people could not look from outside inside. Ah, yeah. Hmm. yeah. But um, uh, because it's mirrored glass. Yeah, yeah. sort of. Yeah, but uh, there was there is a lot of activity which originally I, I was a little bit afraid that it was going to be too confusing about readability and too full, but uh, finally it worked very well. Yeah, and um, yeah, the, the turbine hall in in wheels we had two vortex in the turbine hall. You know, we did. There were three vortexes, one after the other, and then the the first movement would start in the first vortex or in the third vortex, and it would constantly change direction over the within the sequence of one hour and over the different hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's intense. Uh, I think it, it sounds very, how shall I say, yeah, practical thing. But one of those big issues has, of course, been the floor. Yeah. And bringing dance in the museum. But one of the of the big things, if you want to do really physically intensive dance, and that it goes beyond pedestrian movement, and especially where there is jumping in it yeah. and running. Uh, that's really super complicated in those museums because they all have generally stone floor. Mm -hmm. So that was a big financial investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that makes it uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, yeah, showers and so But for those things, we find solutions. Mm -hmm. But the floor is, you know, how shall I say? Uh, it's a, on the body when you're mm -hmm. jumping Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in that sense... If dancing is also about defying gravity and that angle, it's a vertical angle and a horizontal angle, it's your first partner. Mm -hmm. The floor is your first partner. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the running shoes, which is the choice to protect the dancer's feet, or is it more, does it change the quality of the movement from a proscenium, or is it not even a consideration? Well, no, but dancing in sneakers, that's already uh, a long story no mm -hmm. i mean there's no, nothing new the great colors eh? the great the colors, colors. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's red shoes like a movie no? yeah. oh, you, you had a question yeah with, with um, it's having fire on your feet mm -hmm. you know it's having fire on your feet it makes you 
move and uh, the whole thing about color and also with the costume is a really super delicate and intriguing uh, it, question. It changes also, right? I think the costumes here are slightly different than in the previous. Yes, yes. Mm. We decided with Anna and, and Veronica and Helena on Monday that I'm a little bit experimenting with it. Yeah, yes, I thought so. Mm. Yeah. My question is, I'm yet to see the MoMA version of it, although I've seen um, footages from um, the other uh, museum locations. But in the Vortex Temper, the black box version, it's it was also, for me at least, an emotional vortex almost, because of the darkness or, or the yeah. dynamic between light and dark and the music's own gravity towards the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hesitant to say that there's a narrative, but there was some um, emotional quality that you were communicating, and the movements, kind of, um, the kicks, the jumps, the viscerality of the spinal uh, inversions, uh, they kind of colored that emotion almost. And I was wondering if this, how this um, layering, decomposing worked in the museum version? Well, uh, the, the not so the, the layering is but not decomposition. I, I wouldn't call it an emotional quality, it's an energetic quality. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, it's an energetic level and I think color is super important. You know, color is energetically, it's super important. Imagine that we will all be, imagine that we will all be dressed here in yellow no, but I mean, or in pink, or in uh, no. Imagine that you come in the space and everybody's dressed in in yellow would be a t totally different thing. And for vortex temporum, um, the theaters are always generally they're black, mm -hmm. they're dark because they're related. I think to related to the kind of. Um, hmm. Dark, yeah. the walls of the theater. Yeah, it yeah. felt more secretive, more almost religious. There's this, you know, cosmic, this sort cosmic, of. serious. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, um, yeah, it's a, a big difference. We don't have, uh, we don't have pictures of vortex. Here. No, but it is, uh, it, 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 it's an energetic thing, and water. You know, in Chinese philosophy also, water is linked to the color black. Uh, and movement is also, what is typical about water? The water is always going down, no? Mm. Unless you have, as a reaction, but water is going down. So also this, this movement, what it starts, it's sort of the movement that curls down. And the whiteness of the, the space and the white costumes on the white things that it, it, it creates a totally uh, literally it's in the, the black box version is dark mm -hmm. and, and there's, literally there's pressure also almost yeah yeah and it's also it's also one thing is that in the black in the black box the space is condensed you know the space is condensed so the energy in it is uh, is somehow that makes it the energy is more condensed. It's like in a pressure cooker more, and it it uh, it makes in a certain way more theatrical or dramatic. Dramatic. Exactly. Yes. It's less participatory. Yeah, it's less participatory, but it, it's a different energetic field. Mm. You know. Yeah. So here, it, does it dissolve or or transform into something else? Well, I, I think go of it. <laughs> because of the space is bigger, the space is more wide, and the museums are the, generally the basic color is there, there is an openness, and I think on on many energetic levels, also the fact that everybody is moving and mm. there is constant flow, mm -hmm. and people, you don't have to forget in in. Um, in, in, in the black box, you, you, you have this mass of people who are sitting on their chair. Uh. This My question falls right into this, actually, which is, you know, you were talking before when you were over there about the way that in the museum space, uh, when the dancers are 
reaching the limits of the space and the people are right there, that there's a different experience of um, how you're involved. Yeah, yeah. Be, you know, being able to to feel the energy expenditure, the labor of the dancing. And I often think about as a dancer when I'm viewing a work, you know, there's, I mean, we all, if there's a work of walking or skipping or running, we've all walked, we've all skipped, we've all run, most of us. And, and so there's a sense in your body of what's happening. But if you, if an audience sitting in their chair in the black box space doesn't have the um, kinesthetic information of, of what a, a kind of choreographed movement is and feels like in the body, there's a there's something that maybe can't be um, exchanged. Oh, yeah. That maybe can be in the museum space when the dancer comes right up to the to the audience, and that person who maybe doesn't have dance expertise can actually feel um, what's molecularly changing in the body. And I, I guess I wonder um, if that museum experience of, of what socially can be communicated between the dancer and the non-dancer bodies informs any of your work um, in the black box stage space because do you feel when you're in the in the stage space that there's any kind of gap or loss of that um, connection? Yeah, 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 it's totally different. Eh? You have way much more two separate spaces mm -hmm. and also because simply when you're on stage most of the of it's dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't yes. have individuality. Right. You don't have colors. You don't right. have. Uh, uh, you don't see how people watch. It's it's completely different. Is that something that, is that, yeah. to be like overcome in the theater, or is that just something like the theater? No, I think it's di different right. situations. It's yeah. it's, it's totally yeah. different situations. It's a it's also different collective experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't have the need to make a kind of moral judgment or even aesthetic judgment about it, but it's uh, mm. it's definitely a different experience. Um, yeah, and of course, the most. From ancient times, the most natural experience to to, to 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 experience dance is to dance all together. No, yeah, mm. no. yeah, is to uh, not to watch the dancing, but we we only yeah. have five minutes left. So could I yeah. ask for the two questions to be spoken, and then perhaps we could just uh, address them in a combined. So first, your question, and then yours. Uh, I stayed in MoMA with you for, for four hours, the first day exhibition, and uh, during the night, the, the conversation you with the audiences, you mentioned you got many ideas from the uh, Eastern philosophy, especially Chinese like Yin and Yang. So my question is, which starting point so impressed you a lot for your choreography for Yin and Yang? So Yin and Yang, and then one final question, and then we'll go back to... So yin and yang. <laughs> we, yeah. At least we get to hear the questions. Oh, I'll so. say, as somebody, I work on uh, art that is not performed, etc. And that, that we got to a situation where it's reversed. I mean, MoMA, Bobo, the Tate are a nightmare of noise, etc., etc. In fact, dance brings back discipline, order, clarity to the museum. <laughs> really? I mean, Structures you know, the, the noise, yeah. more money, you have to brace yourself to go. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's back to the museum the way it was in the 19th century. You, know, you think gorgeous. so? Oh, yes. I, do. <laughs> I don't see that silence. So, <laughs> two so, questions <laughs> to consider. But, so uh, we, 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 art uh, back, in a funny way. Uh, paradox. Um, what, well, about the Eastern philosophy, there is a lot to be said, and it's for me a, a very long story that has become a part not only of my artistic practice but of my daily life. Uh, it's mainly a different, a different thinking about energy. It's a different worldview, it's a different, yeah. And mainly what I, that is very much inspired by the observation of nature. Yeah. Um, I like to combine the idea of ancient wisdom and 
modern technology of Western analytical view and more holistic view, uh, 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 approach of, of organizing. Uh, I'm. I came through it through my background. Is my my parents was my mother was a teacher. My father was a farmer. Um, yeah, and then I came through it mainly through through cooking, through microbiotics and and. To that practice, I, I started to be interested in the philosophy. Um, I think uh, in the in the in these times, in these times where I, I think we are at crucial points of the history of humanity, where with the rise of artificial intelligence and uh, high, technolo high technological advancements. The we we get in questioning the the, the presence of the body and how our your humanity is anchored in the in the body. And you you see that things start to cross and when there is an an incredible speed where you have the feeling that. That well, basically, robots are and artificial intelligence is going to take over, and that we will become in our uh, physicality that, that we will become superfluous. On the other hand, with the rise of ecological disasters, and you get that a lot of people are more and more aware about the importance of approaching on many different level, levels uh, going back to simple, natural and ancient wisdom um, you know those things are rising I think we're speaking about the vortex and the spiral I think we're getting more and more close to the center of a spiral uh, we do know that two things are particularly, three things are particularly specific to spirals is that at the middle there is stillness. It, there, is, there is only, there is no end, there is a change of direction. Any spiral, when it closes at a certain point, it opens again. And the other thing about spiral movement is, is that you always come back to the same place in a different way. So it's constantly changing. It's constantly changing what the shape of that change is, what scale, um, uh, is a big question. But I, I, I think... Uh, and I do... You know, I, I do... This is one of the th things what I, I really think about live performance. And why I'm also happy quite about this this possible new setting of live performance mm. in the museum is it because it creates uh, in a crucial way um, different uh, uh, new ways of having collective experiences uh, where you're in, a, in an extremely embodied reality and where you can relate with a group of people where you can position yourself individually and where you share the same time and space. You share the same time and space. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, that kind of involve, involvement is... Uh, so there I think there is still a lot in the same way as um, I said in the beginning there are a lot of different strategies. I was interested in the relationship between sound and movement. But I think also in relationship to yeah, with visual arts and the museums and live performance about I think there are a lot of questions I ask myself about it 
and what potentially can come out of it. But there is one thing we didn't address at all was the whole, what you spoke about, the whole economical part, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, an economy and in a market where I think, I don't know, visual arts in a certain degree, yeah, compared to performing arts, I mean, this is the question of how we dancers are not objects, mm -hmm. this is not specul speculative, yeah, right? yeah, you can't, you can't buy, right. um, or invest, invest, yeah. do you want to, do you want to pay for labor, uh, what is memory, uh, how is memory shaping the future and shaping the present or the space between future and so that are really uh, uh, beautiful questions, beautiful questions, uh, but um, yeah, also I think which sort of go around them, um, uh, on, in a very concrete scale about things that we're all facing today and how we, how we deal with that in uh, mm. coming times. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you very much for your time today and it was a great pleasure to hear you talk about the work and uh, if you haven't seen it yet, please go and see it or come back again. Um, we've got a small token of appreciation to thank you uh, and also I'd like to thank Frederic for organising this on our behalf and uh, so maybe a round of applause. Thank you.